It prompts me to tell you that, you know, I've had an interesting background. I've been, I'm a former practically everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that doesn't mean that I know what I'm talking about. You know, you have, to, you have to compare everything I say with what you know from the writings of the faith, as you do with any speaker, anybody in the faith, including the hands of the cause of God, I might add, not in any mean spirit, but I was around them a lot and I, I saw they had their moments too where they would... <laughs> something, whatever. Some, the other night I said that martyrdom of Bob was in 1870. I didn't know I'd said that, but there you are. <laughs> People say, well, that's very strange, you know. <laughs> anyway, tonight I'm going to try to base myself on the writings of Shoghi Effendi. The, the idea of the, the meetings that I'm holding uh, around the different places here in Southern California, is to suggest to us that it may be um, both useful and inspiring if we review the ministry of the Bob, the role of the Bob in our faith, what's his position, what's his relationship to Baha'u'llah, what's his relationship to the human race itself, so many things. I think it's really... Uh, uh, helpful. So I've looked at this and I thought, well, what, if we're trying to talk about the Bob, what would, we, what would we be referring to in terms of his uh, role? And I've divided this into some, some uh, quotations, some readings, some thoughts about, first of all, what is his mission? And then what is his... Um, station and rank in the cause and then about his person what do we know about his person what do we know about his ministry which then becomes the not his mission has an intention and the ministry has a series of events through which the mission was carried out we've got different ways of looking at this and finally for the third day of talks which I'm not going to be here for what is his import? What has been his import on the world? You'll need to look that up yourselves and I'll give you a clue. Shoghi Effendi, in the centenary of the martyrdom of the Bob, wrote a glorious message to the American friends. Dated July 4th, July 5th, 1950. If you look that up, you'll see Shoghi Effendi has poured his heart out and outlined the effects of the mission of the Bob on the world, including the first energies contributing to its coming of age and to the birth, eventual birth, through the administrative order of the world order of the cause. Let's look back at some of these other things first. What, what if you were asked, you know, these are, these are uh, uh, things that I wanted to make us reflect ourselves, you know. If someone said to you, what's the mission, what was the mission of the Bob? Well, you could say, well, I'm a, I'm a Baha'i, I don't know very much about these things, but I can refer you to somebody else. You can do that. But you have some ideas of yourself. Are you brave? Are you saying, you know, I hope I get it right? And what? what what would I choose out of everything to say is the mission of the Bob? So I just, a couple seconds for you to answer that in yourself. You don't have to say anything to anybody else, but let's see where we go from there. Got it? You're all ready now to give a talk on the mission of the Bob, a little <laughs> bit, a short one, but something with content, which requires us to think back about what we have heard and hopefully what we have read and studied and tried to master in terms of the Don Burkers and the selected writings of the Bob and the writings of Shoghi Effendi and so many places God passes by and the World Order Letters and the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah where he's referred to this. 
This comes from a statement that Shoghi Fendi prepared, a summary of the aims, teachings, and history of the faith for a special commission of the United Nations at the time that the United Nations was looking at the, the role which different religions in the Holy Land, in Israel, in what was going to become Israel, might have or could have in relation to each other. So it's quite an interesting commission. I think it was fairly large, about 30 people internationally selected. And they addressed a, a letter, a request to Shoghi Effendi if he would give to them a summary of the aims and intentions and the position of the Baha'i faith in the Holy Land. And so Shoghi Effendi responded. And these are some of the points he made. He starts right off, he said, the forerunner of the faith, this is not, not the beginning of the message, this is where he's recounting the history of the faith. The forerunner of the faith was Mirza Ali Muhammad of Shiraz, known as the Bab, the gate, who proclaimed on May 23rd, 1844, his twofold mission as an independent manifestation of God and herald of one greater than himself, who would inaugurate a new and unprecedented era in the religious history of mankind. Kind of teases the reader, you know, well, what, what, could, what, what does all that mean? So that I'm sure it was, uh, had its impact on the readers of that commission. Further into the message, he <coughs> takes up the history. That was like the mission is that he's an independent manifestation of God and he's herald of one greater than himself. Then he says the Baha'i faith revolves around three central figures. Uh, this uh, term central figures, you've all heard that I think. You, you can imagine who the central figures are. Shoghi Effendi outlines them in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah where he really mentions them for the first time. And he, he says that uh, there are these three central figures. And then he refers to the central figure, which, of course, is Baha'u'llah. And he says, sometimes he refers to the central figure. Sometimes he refers to the twin central figures of the faith, which in that case, of course, becomes Baha'u'llah and the Bab. And when he elaborates the position of these three central figures in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, he, he begins with Baha'u'llah, not with the Bab. In other words, he doesn't do it historically, he does it hierarchically, he does it with the importance and central position of each of these figures. The Baha'i faith revolves around three central figures, the first of whom was a youth, a native of Shiraz, named Mirza Ali Muhammad, known as the Gate who in May 1844, at the age of 25, advanced the claim of being the herald, who according to the sacred scriptures of previous dispensations, must needs announce and prepare the way for the advent of one greater than himself, whose mission would be, according to those same scriptures, to inaugurate an era of righteousness and peace. An era that would be hailed as the consummation of all previous dispensations and initiate a new cycle in the religious history of mankind. Praise God for Shoghi Effendi. I don't know how we would have gotten that all together <laughs> organized in such a succinct way with all of the different facets of the truth that it contains. Well worth our study. Now this message is sometimes a little hard to come by it's been published in Baha'i World volumes in the past. Uh, it's online. I think you can find it through Baha'ilibrary.com. In any, in any case, those of you that are more book-centered will be able to find it and perhaps make copies. The assembly can provide an electronic copy for you. It's, it's the way, I think, the introduction to Baha'is as to the content of what we should be delivering to the public. You know, okay, with each individual, there's perhaps a different way, an approach, or something that we're inspired. We say our prayers, and we ask to be inspired, and say that which the seekers or people we might speak 
do during the day in the course of our activities, what, which one of these uh, would be appropriate? All right. that, that's an inspiration in itself. But when we're giving a general introduction, an overview, if you will, of what the Baha'i Faith is, there's certain things we don't want to leave out and we want to have them in proper balance with each other. And this is a model of that, you know. Now, the question of rank, let's see if we can find those parts here, sorry. Moving on, we're going to come back to the ministry. We talked about mission. We're going to come back to ministry. We're looking now at rank and station of the Bab. Again, back to the words of Shoghi Effendi. In this case, the, the, we're, I'm quoting from several of the World Order letters. The Golden Age of the Cause of Baha'u'llah and the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah. This is just following uh, Shoghi Effendi's appraisal of the magnitude of the station of Baha'u'llah with respect to the religious history of mankind. He moves on and he says, not only in the character of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, how stupendous be his claim, does the greatness of this dispensation reside. Friends, you realize, you know, that both Baha'u'llah and the Bab have made terrific claims. But can you, uh, who, who is there on earth that can tell us who they are if they don't say who they are themselves? You have enough uh, passages in the prayers and meditations of Baha'u'llah to realize how humble he was and how humble the Bab was. And yet when they're saying the truth, they have to say the truth. And they tell us who they are. Thank God, how would we ever know, except maybe for the feeling of love that we have if we had, enco if we had encountered them, if we'd lived at that time and had our eyes open and could see spiritually. For among the distinguishing features of the faith ranks as a further evidence of its uniqueness, the fundamental truth that in the person of its forerunner, the Bab, every follower of Baha'u'llah recognizes not merely an inspired annunciator, but a direct manifestation of God. It is their firm belief that, here he's describing in his letters what we should be believing, it is their firm belief that no matter how short the duration of his dispensation, and however brief the period of the operation of his laws, the Bab had been endowed with a potency such as no founder of any of the past religions was, in the providence of the Almighty, allowed to possess. Unique, totally unique in spiritual history of mankind. That he was not merely the precursor of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, that he was more than a divinely inspired personage, that his was the station of an independent, self-sufficient manifestation of God, is abundantly demonstrated by himself, is affirmed in unmistakable terms by Baha'u'llah, and finally, is attested by the will and testament of Abdul Baha. Nowhere but in the kitab e gone Baha'u'llah's masterly exposition of the one unifying truth underlying all the revelations of the past, can we obtain a clearer apprehension of the potency of those forces inherent in that preliminary manifestation with which his own faith stands indissolubly associated. The Bab is the defense the uh, Igon is the defense of, ba of the Bab by Baha'u'llah. It's his demonstration. He's written it as a Babi. It's a book of revelation, and it turns out that it's the 
the foremost book of doctrine of Baha'u'llah. Shoghi Effendi said this is the outstanding doctrinal work of Baha'u'llah, the, the Book of Certitude. And in the numerous letters, after its translation to English, he said that the Baha'is should be studying it very carefully. And uh, I heard in the Holy Land that one day he was saying to the, asking the friends at the table of the pilgrims if they'd read the kitab e They went around the table and one woman said yes. And an American man, bless his heart, he said that he'd done it too. <laughs> Shoghi Hindi didn't say any, he didn't comment on it till the next pilgrim group. And then he said, I was speaking to the friends about the Egon and there was one man who was here who said he'd done it. Friends, you can't do the Egon, it doesn't finish. <laughs> it must go over and over and over and study it and so on and so on. Impetuous Americans, huh? <laughs> so, he refers to the content of the Egon as numerous points that should be mastered by the believers so that when they recount the truths of the faith, these truths come into clear reflection with what Baha'u'llah has said in the Book of Certitude. This is the foundation of all of our teaching work, friends, in general. It also gives us a clear picture of the Bab, praises the Bab so highly. Rank and station in a further message here. Uh, Shoghi Fendi again refers to this theme. And we're going to read some passages from this tonight. There can be no doubt that the claim to the twofold station, now we're hearing that more than once, twofold station, ordained for the Bob by the Almighty, a claim which he himself has so boldly advanced which Baha'u'llah has repeatedly affirmed and to which the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha has finally given the sanction of its testimony constitutes the most distinctive feature of the Baha'i dispensation. Oh, what a phrase. The most distinctive feature of the Baha'i revelation is this twofold station of the Bab. Oh. When Shoghi Effendi describes the relationship between the Bab and Baha'u'llah, he refers to it with these words. Allied, though subordinate in rank, and invested with the authority of presiding with him over the destinies of this supreme dispensation, there shines upon this mental picture. He's been describing first Baha'u'llah and then he describes the Bab. We'll come back to the picture, mental picture, but the words that are helpful for, I think, for us to uh, reflect on, absorb, and, and think about are allied though subordinate in rank. That's the relationship of the Bab with Baha'u'llah. I myself have uh, liked to liken this to planetary systems where you have two suns at the center of the solar system. One's, and where there are two suns, and there are a number of this throughout the universe, there are a number of this. There's one sun that's always fixed, it's the center. And the other one circles around it. And the people on the planet enjoy the benefit of double light shadows and colorful affairs and so on, I imagine. I don't know, I haven't lived on those planets, so I can't really tell you about that, but <laughs> you get the idea. Now, this is the thing that's so exceptional. Now, this is the thing that's different from John the Baptist and the Christ, for example. John the Baptist was, according to the Quran, a manifestation of God himself. Not just that, he was also had this twofold uh, character. But the twofold character did not, did not apply to the Christian dispensation. It was preliminary, and then it was over, and Christ was carry this out. But what we see here in the Baha'i writings is that the Bab reigns together with Baha'u'llah over our destinies. And his light 
two independent sources of divine light are shining upon the world order of Baha'u'llah, shining upon the guardianship, shining upon the universal house of justice, shining upon all our efforts as the inheritors of this revelation which forbids clergy, which ends up placing on our shoulders the responsibility before God to share it with others. We have these two independent sources of divine light shining on us. We have, the, and you know, you know from your prayers and your prayer book, you've got the prayers of the Bob, for example. I highly recommend you, if you haven't uh, explored the last part of the book of selections of the writings of, Baha of the Bob that was published by the House of Justice some years ago, go and look at the last 50 pages. It has a whole slew of prayers of the Bob which aren't anywhere else. Many of them are in the prayer book, but many of them are not. It's for this bicentenary period, that's a nice special bounty. I, I know that uh, from uh, my, my time in the past in the World Center that eventually we'll have more volumes of, of the Bob's writings. But for now we have the selections from the tablets that are there, but we also have these wonderful prayers. Going back again to the question of the rank and some of the passages that are there, I want to, let's see, I, this is all, not altogether organized in my own mind, little by little, or it's coming together as I give these talks. How does Baha'u'llah, in, in the whole range of his revelation, how, do, how does he refer to the Bob? What words does he use to refer to this co-being, something that exists together. In fact, in some passages, um, he blends the, the two of them together. He said, my own previous manifestation. And he said, there's no difference between the Bab and Baha'u'llah, except they were they, in their individual, in their personal part, because you know this, the manifestations have this double station. They have the station of an individual, but they also had the station of oneness with all the other manifestations of God, which means that the words that they speak when they bring forth revelation is one reality within them that's reflected. It's the, it's the mere image of divinity, of this vast, immense, potent, omnipotent God of the universe, reigning and sustaining and developing all of the planets and systems of the whole endless universe. Now try to stick endless universe in your head. You know. it is, it's like, it, it, like God doesn't go in there. Yes, you can't. You cannot have the consciousness of God. You can understand something about his signs. He gives us marvelous signs. He said his signs are his, his verses. His signs are all of the activities of the universe around us. His signs are in our own souls, the things we discover through our interaction with his light, the gifts and unique character of each one of us if we pursue the light that he says is in us. My light is in thee, get thou from it thy radiance. What a beautiful phrase. And that light is the thing that develops us so that we're able to deliver the message properly. So Baha'u'llah, out of, out, of out of his whole revelation, Shoghi Effendi has chosen five references from Baha'u'llah's words to describe the Bab. I'm sure I couldn't guess what they were before I looked at them again recently. I wouldn't have. The first one is the essence of essences, the sea of seas. This is a reference uh, that, show, that uh, Baha'u'llah makes to the Bab in the Igon itself. The second one, the point round whom the realities of the prophets and messengers revolve. The third, from whom God hath caused to proceed the knowledge 
of all that was and shall be. Whose rank excelleth that of all the prophets. And whose revelation transcendeth the comprehension and understanding of all their chosen ones. Now, you have to counter that by other passages in the writing that said, beware that you exalt one prophet over the other prophets. They are all prophets. But the degree of their mission gives them distinction. And you'll recall something that you've repeated a number of times, and that is that the Bab is the king of the messengers of God in the Tablet of Ahmad. Baha'u'llah gives him that title. So you can look those up in, uh, in the dispensation and also in, in God Passes By. With respect to the um, all knowledge coming from the Bob, let me refer back to a passage that's in the in the Egon itself. Wishing to stress, Shoghi Effendi begins this section, wishing to stress the sublimity of the Bab's exalted station as compared with that of the prophets of the past. Baha'u'llah in that same epistle asserts, no understanding can grasp the nature of his revelation, nor can any knowledge comprehend the full measure of his faith. Could be discouraging as you hear that, you know, you say, well, what's the point of making an effort? But we're still told to make an effort because some aspects of this thing will come to us through these quotations. Baha'u'llah then quotes in confirmation of his argument these prophetic words from a revelation of the past. Knowledge is 20 and seven letters. All that the prophets have revealed are two letters thereof. No man thus far hath known more than these two letters. But when the Qa'im shall arise, he will cause the remaining twenty and five letters to be made manifest. The Bab is the Qa'im. His revelation constitutes that terrific outpouring if knowledge were divided into twenty-seven letters. I mean, it's obviously Somebody wrote the Guardian and said, but some alphabets don't have 27 letters. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the point is we're seeing, we're, we think of it symbolically. You know, if, if all knowledge were 27 letters, divided into 27 letters, two of them we've had some access to in the past. Now we have 25. All you need to do is read The Gate of the Heart by Nadir Saidi, quoting all these passages from the Bob. It's so profound that it leaves your head twirling to realize the, what the, the vastness of the revelation and how that'll be studied once we, we finish a little bit with our teaching assignment to share the, the faith with the rest of mankind, we'll have time to consider these deeper spiritual aspects of the cause. Maybe you can get in a few minutes a day now, but in the future I think there'll be a lot more time for that. Behold, he adds, Baola adds, how great and lofty is his station. His rank excelleth that of all the prophets, and his revelation transcendeth the comprehension and understanding of all their chosen ones. Of his revelation, he further adds, the prophets of God, his saints and chosen ones, have either not been informed or in pursuance of God's inscrutable decree, they have not disclosed. From the Bob himself about his station, he says, I am the mystic fane. He proclaims his station in the Qayyum al-Asma, the first and greatest of his works. I am the mystic fane which the hand of omnipotence hath raised. I am the lamp of God which the finger of God hath lit within its niche and caused to shine with deathless splendor. I am the flame of that supernal light that glowed upon Sinai in the gladsome spot. 
and lay concealed in the midst of the burning bush. Should it be our wish, he again affirms, this is the Bob, the Bob. it is in our power to compel through the agency of but one letter of our revelation, the world and all that is, there, that is therein to recognize in less than the twinkling of an eye the truth of our cause. What? What kind of a claim is that? One letter he says he can issue from his mouth and the whole world will submit and bow down before him. That's the power of the manifestation. He doesn't exercise that power. He releases the energies in the world and he leaves it to our choice, our free will, so that we might participate rather than be awed or terrified into submission. He gives us an opportunity to turn and recognize, recognize him. That's the basis of everything that, that we, our relationship with God is, this is the whole judgment. This is the, the record they play back for you at the end of your life to see how, so that you can decide which way the scale is going. He says, we perform that ourselves. We recognize it. Having, when we see it, we recognize it. Baha'u'llah in a tablet, he's asked about angels, what, what angels are, are involved with us. There's a, a verse in the Quran, it says there, some of the angels, two-winged, three-winged, two-winged, four-winged, six-winged angels. What does this refer to? And he says there are various categories of angels, the souls that have passed, that are sanctified, that move on to the next world. They have various assignments. He said the most part of the angels are occupied with helping the peoples of the earth. They're the ones that are around when you want to get some inspiration to say something useful to your neighbor. They're the ones that spread the influence of your devotions in the morning, as you see from the passage in the opening of the prayer book who in the privacy of his chambers recites these verses, the scattering angels of the Almighty would. This is not just pretty talk, friends. This is some kind of a, a picture that he gives us of how actually the divine energies are propagated. Who knows what your neighbors are experiencing? <laughs> Don't forget to talk to them about the faith sometime. <laughs> Again, he says, I am the primal point from which have been generated all created things. That's another thing. The idea of a point is the beginning of everything. And he is that point, he says. Of course, that's he in his internal role as a manifestation of God. Having been raised up by God and becoming a focal point for the release of these heavenly forces into the world and into our lives. I am the countenance of God, whose splendor can never be obscured, the light of God, whose radiance can never fade. All the keys of heaven God hath chosen to place on my right hand, and all the keys of hell on my left. I am one of the sustaining pillars of the primal word of God. Whosoever hath recognized me hath known all that is true and right and hath attained all that is good and seemly. The substance wherewith God hath created me is not the clay out of which others have been formed. He hath conferred upon me that which the worldly wise can never comprehend, nor the faithful discover. urge you friends go back and read and reread these things read them out loud think about their meaning think about the implication and you're going to come to this bicentenary commemoration full of new spirit his person we come to the question of the person of the Bob what was the person of the Bob like fortunately we have Shoghi Effendi who has only seen the Bob in terms of his spiritual vision. So obviously they were years apart, decades apart in their lives. He's given us two pen portraits, if you will, of the Bob. Now think of yourself, you want, if somebody asks you, what was the Bob like? 
What was he like? What, would you, what was the first thing that comes to your mind to tell a person if they asked you that? Okay, you've got that? Now we're going to hear what Shoghi Effendi, how he describes it. He's done this in two places. We're going to do the first one is from the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, taking up the continuation of the phrase that allied those subordinate in rank. There shines upon this mental picture the youthful glory of the Bab. Now think of these elements. You put them all together and you look through this kaleidoscope of qualities. Youthful glory. Infinite in his tenderness. Irresistible in his charm. Unsurpassed in his heroism. Matchless in the dramatic circumstances of his short yet eventful life. What a combination. Hi friends, I liked, I liked, and when I were in the Holy, was in the Holy Land, I liked to reflect on these qualities before going in the shrines. It's something, you, it's like, or if you haven't seen this and you read it after you've been in the shrine, you say, that's what I felt in the shrine. And you read the description Shoghi Effendi has for Baha'u'llah and you feel the same thing. This power, this glory. Again, in God Passes By, in the foreword to God Passes By. Friends, the foreword to God Passes By is the whole of God Passes By in miniature. You don't want to lose it. It's like a pill, you know, you can take the thing and you get the whole, the initial picture, the vision, the, the breadth of, of what Shoghi Effendi has done, how he has reduced the most exalted, the most astounding century in the history of the human race, how he's reduced it into a volume. He's had to condense it. You have to uncondense it. You have to read it and think, what are the other implications of this? You have to correlate the first five chapters of God Passes By with the whole of the Dawnbreakers. They're, they interact with each other. Shoghi Fendi systematizes, he puts it forth, he, tells you what, how, what are the most outstanding events, what are those elements that you should see in a, in a greater light than the others. And then he gives, with his own masterful editing and translation of Nabil's narrative, he gives you the episodes themselves upon which he's based his conclusions. So here in God Passes By, he says the first period centers around, and here we have new qualities Parallel, but, uh, but not ident identical. This centers around the gentle, the youthful, and irresistible person of the Bob. Matchless in his meekness. Imperturbable in his serenity. Magnetic in his utterance. Unrivaled in the dramatic episodes of his swift and tragic ministry. Are we going to get any closer to the Bob in description than those I don't, I can't imagine where and how we would do it. Look them up if you make them your own, be able to repeat them or share them even in a spoken written form with the friends. Let them, let their vision of the Bob in preparation for this bicentenary be enhanced, enlarged, moved uh, to new horizons, so to speak. Back to the ministry. Remember we were contrasting he has a mission, but then the mission is carried out through a ministry. The ministry is made up of a series of, of events and developments. Okay? Shoghi Effendi, again, he reduces. I mean, the, it's, it's nine years of terrific dramatic events, and he reduces it to a few paragraphs in two spots, which enables us to kind of take in the miniature picture of it. And then we have the right balance. We can add the other elements again from the five chapters of God Passes By, the first five chapters, 
and from the contents of the Dombergers. Describing the Bob's ministry says, swift and severe persecution launched by the organized forces of church and state in his native land precipitated successively his arrest, his exile to the mountains of Azerbaijan, his imprisonment in the fortresses of Maku and Cherik, and his execution in July 1950 by a firing squad in the public square of Tabriz. What's that? Four stages. Here he's reduced it to four different stages. No less, he goes on to explain this ministry, no less than 20,000 of his followers were put to death with such barbarous cruelty as to evoke the warm sympathy and the unqualified admiration of a number of Western writers, diplomats, travelers, and scholars, some of whom were witnesses of these abominable outrages and were moved to record them in their books and diaries. Now this paragraph is particularly addressed to this commission of the United Nations because these are Westerners and this isn't some story that the Easterners tell and that that's, that's all it is. The, the, the effects of the Bob's ministry and the events of that period, they moved to Europe and the hearts and the capital cities of Europe knew about these things. Well, there's a young man in uh, Spain, terrific scholar of the faith, Amina Hea, he's, several of his books are published now, has done research to the degree that he, find, he found in Spanish newspapers in the earliest years of the, of the Bob's mission, the burning of the beard of Codus is per reported in Spanish newspapers in 18 whatever, what it was, 45, 46. Incredible. And successively, every, every other detail comes out. The expulsion of uh, Mola Bastami out of Shiraz, uh, reported in European newspapers. There was some bright Spanish consul, consular agent in Shiraz that was sending this news back and it became syndicated. And the people were following it because they saw what an impact the message of this young Mercer, this young prophet of, of Shiraz was causing in the, in the whole nation. So that's one view. Now the one in the foreword of God Passes By is another quick summary. Let me share that with you too. This gives you some idea of what are the elements that we would talk about if we want to talk about a reduced history of the bomb. It begins, the ministry begins with the declaration of his mission culminates in his martyrdom and ends in a veritable orgy of religious massacre, revolting in its hideousness. It's characterized by nine years of fierce and relentless contest, whose theater was the whole of Persia, in which above 10,000 heroes laid down their lives and in which two sovereigns of the Qajar dynasty and their wicked ministers participated, and which was supported by the entire Shia ecclesiastical hierarchy, by the military resources of the state, and by the implacable hostility of the masses. What a convulsion the Bab caused in this country. Announcement of this, and then the whole Shia clergy establishment, which Shoghi Effendi says is the prime enemy of the Bab, arises to negate what he's doing, to try to remove the influence that he's having. And that causes this convulsion, really, in the whole country. It's amazing history. We look back again at the Dombrik, it's precious. We never have had a look at the early days of Revelation in any writings in the past dispensations of the prophets. It's an extraordinary contribution. A bigger overview for the kind of larger picture, without getting into the details of the events themselves, you'll find in the table of contents of God Passes By. 
uh, I've seen the letters exchanged between the publishers and Shoghi Effendi and his secretaries that he has included not only the chapter of each chapter but he's included subtitles subheadings which describe the contents of each chapter they're not in the book itself they're in the table of contents at the beginning of the book but it's very helpful to to look and see these look for and identify these sections in each of the chapters as a sample first chapter is the birth of the Bobby revelation starts with declaration of the Bob's mission enrollment of the letters of the living the Bob's pilgrimage to Mecca the Bob's arrest and departure for Isfahan from Shiraz the Bob's sojourn in Isfahan chapter 1 chapter 2 the Bob's captivity in Azerbaijan the significance of his captivity Shoghi Fendi describes it and brings things from the writings about it his incarceration in Maku and later in Cherik his examination in Tabriz friends do you realize when they questioned the Bob when they tried to trick him when they accused him of using the wrong grammar in what his answers were to them so insulting I mean incredibly insulting who was sitting in the in the in that room with them this 17 year old Nasser Deen who was to become the Shah shortly later he saw the Bob declare himself the promised Qayyim can't say he didn't know about it he was right there in the heart of it his uh, crimes and shortcomings are legend I think it's hard to find anybody in a more difficult predicament when they died than Nasruddin Shah. Mr. Olinga said to me, I was traveling with him and he was reporting on his pilgrimage from time to time, he said, Shoghi Effendi spoke in the most disparaging terms of Nasruddin Shah. And he said when he died, he went straight to hell. <laughs> I, was, I was translating this to former Catholic Baha'is in Buenos Aires and there was a bit of a stir in the back of the room one lady said fanning herself they don't like to hear about <laughs> hell nothing about hell please and then so I thought well it was a bit a bit edgy I turned to Mr. Olinga for the next and he said and he's still there <laughs> when I translated and he's still there she fell off her she fainted right off her chair and we had to go and revive her and stop the meeting and so well, not, nobody wants to hear about hell very real as far as I can see in the Baha'i writings not a lot of stress but enough references that you better know it's there and <laughs> not some place you want to cozy up to you know <laughs> we have responsibilities as Baha'is how can we dispatch those responsibilities and gain if you will the good pleasure of God he's raised us up dear audience I mean Friends, you know, you know yourselves, but some of you maybe don't know the rest of the people in the room. There are people here who are descended from families that lost many members of their families in, the, in this Holocaust in, in Iran in the time of the, of the bomb. I've met people here that are descendants from Mullah Hossein's family. It's all wonderful, wonderful histories. I hope you're asking your grandparents and your forefathers reading their accounts and looking into the history that that you have that's so connected to the ministry of the Bob so its significance of his captivity incarceration in Maku and Sharik his examination in Tabriz his writings his covenant and the conference of Badasht then he goes on for these other three chapters he outlines the contents too so you can you kind of form a um, if you will a a recap in your own mind of things you may have heard that you don't know quite how to connect them all together different stories about the Bob how do we form them how do we tie them down so that in our memory we can speak of them with confidence and some authority to the public in general, to our friends, to each other, reminding us of 
the multiple dimensions of the Bob and his mission. As to his writings, I wanted to refer briefly to that. Shoghi Effendi says with the, in this respect, alike in the magnitude of the writings emanating from his pen and in the diversity of the subjects treated in those writings, the Bob's revelation stands wholly unparalleled in the annals of any previous religion. He himself affirms while confined in Maku that up to that time his writings embracing highly diversified subjects had amounted to more than 500,000 verses. The verses which have reigned from this cloud of divine mercy is Baha'u'llah's testimony in the Kitab Gan, have been so abundant that none hath yet been able to estimate their number. A score of volumes are now available. Friends, the, uh, the World Center the, under the direction of the House of Justice had accomplished before I left the World Center, had accomplished computerizing, digitalizing all the available writings of the bomb. And can you imagine how many words that was? Digital, digitally recorded words of the Bob's revelation? Five million words. Now, that's greater than the combined scriptures of all of the previous religions that we have. The Bob has doubled and surpassed the amount of revelation that we've had from the religious prophet, prophetic figures of the past. That's extraordinary in itself. So then we wondered, we get, got busy to count the words of Baha'u'llah. The Bob, you know, in a period of six years, his ministry, and particularly the last three years were the strongest in Revelation. The fact that through destiny, through the acts of the government, through the enemies, through the crisis that was created, he had time to pen the, the Persian Bayan and the Arabic Bayan and all the things that he wrote, a marvelous thing. He also wrote the kitab -e asma which is the longest book of revelation of any prophet in history. Uh, that's another we have to thank Nader Saidi who was instrumental in piecing parts of it that were found in different collections around, manuscript collections around and putting it together so that we see these, I don't know how many thousands of pages of the Kitab Asma, the book of names, the book of the names of God. And you'll see this theme is taken up in the Bob's writings that Nader Saidi refers to in the Gate of the Heart. That uh, the Bob wants everything to be renamed so that the, the names of everything are reminiscent of the names of God. So that we, every, everywhere we look we see the signs of this, the influence of this in the world. Quite, quite an interesting concept. Moving a little out of our subject, I wanted to quote a letter from Shoghi Effendi. First of all, um, when I came into the faith, uh, the guardian was still alive, and I had the bounty of being in meetings where the letters would come by, by cable, one copy, the Los Angeles Baha'i Center would alert everybody in Southern California who could come tonight, we, there's a new letter from the Guardian come and it's going to be read out. And this was ex so exciting, we all rushed to try to get to Los Angeles or to the center of town and see what, was, what this latest letter was about. I remember particularly a letter in early June about the protection of the faith that the Guardian wrote, where he talks about the coming encounters of the forces of light and darkness the engaging in the competition for the rule of the world, so to speak, 
quite exciting things. And he there uh, calls for the appointment of another auxiliary board. He called for one for propagation, and this time he called for one for protection. And said that there were evidences of the agitation of the enemies. He was under assault in the Holy Land. The family, the disaffected family of the Guardian was busy trying to take the properties and shrines away from him, saying that they were a family inheritance and he couldn't keep it from them, so to speak. And Shoghi Effendi wouldn't meet with the, in the courts at all. He sent the hands of the cause and then he had lawyers, intermediaries. He said, the hands of the cause will not sit with these enemies in the same room. There was a meeting room and the, and the lawyers went back and forth with the discussion and that took the court proceedings. And the court proceedings were, were lost to the enemies. But this caused a, a, a difficult disturbance. Ahmad Sorov had arrived in Tel Aviv. He held a press call, a press conference. He said, I'm secretary of Abdul Baha. I want a press conference. They came. He said, you know, I've come back to help the work of the cause here and so on. They said, what, isn't there a, a guardian appointed? And he said, yes, he said, yes, there is. But he hasn't worked out very well. Can you imagine the nerve of this guy? <coughs> Shoghi Effendi died. Within 30 days, Ahmad Sarab died. And his organization just came apart. There's no, no trace of it at all. And Shoghi Effendi said it was the destiny of people who heard of the faith through the covenant breakers that weren't covenant breakers, that they would come to the faith. They eventually came and they would come to the cause. They'd find out the difference. If the friends only realize, Shoghi Effendi addresses us. Ah, the point I wanted to add was they complained to the guardian. Somebody wrote and said, we're under such pressure, Shoghi Effendi. He's calling everybody to arise and get out. He wants to see a veritable exodus from Los Angeles and Southern California to the goals throughout the world. Somebody wrote back and they said, this is too much pressure, Shoghi Effendi. It pushes us all too much. Shoghi Effendi said, there's no pressure from the Guardian. This is the pressure of historical circumstances. You are, you, you are the conveyors, the purveyors of the knowledge of God in this day. It's the pressure of the world needing to know. He said the Baha'is are not drawing sufficiently on the divine confirmations. They are under pressure in the world on high, wanting to see instruments where they can get up and do something and you'll see what confirmations and assistance you'll draw to yourself. If the friends only realized, there's only a few times in history when opportunities for mortal glory come to a people. And that time is now in their hands. They would not for a moment, if this was the case, busy themselves with idle conversation and gossip, but would sacrifice their all for the quickening of the people and the salvation of society. That's the opportunity that's within our reach, friends, if we take full control of that take full advantage of it. We have collective activities, we have, you know, but apart from that, we have our individual responsibility before the command of Baha'u'llah to all Baha'is to arise and propagate the faith of God. Proclaim the faith, he says in one tablet. Very interestingly enough, the next phrase in that tablet is, if anyone shows interest, teach them. We're seeing here a distinction between proclaim the faith and teach the faith. The proclaiming I think we can all do. Maybe we feel inadequate to teach the faith. He tells us we should teach ourselves before we try to teach others, otherwise it doesn't have any effect. But proclaim the faith, it seems to me, has certain elements. We should mention Baha'u'llah, identify Baha'u'llah, and we should indicate that he has brought a message from God to solve the problems of the world. Now you can find different ways to say that to different people. But you want to say, you know, but I'm... Some subject comes up and you say, well, you know, I'm a Baha'i. 
Really, the, the Baha'is are the followers of Baha'u'llah, who we understand is the most recent messenger from God, and he's brought a set of teachings to solve all these terrible problems that are in the world. And then, you know, the person you're speaking to will react in different ways, like, oh, that's crazy, or, <laughs> or they'll say, that's very interesting, what, what, does he, what does he teach? Best example, or the third one is, I'm so glad you found something you like. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next thing show, the, the Guardian, uh, he's of course translated this, that Baha'u'llah says, is that if they don't respond, leave them to themselves. Don't argue with them. Don't try to pressure them in any way. Pray for them. Because you have left a seed in their soul, in their subconscious, by the name of Baha'u'llah, and by identifying him as the resolver of the difficulties of mankind. These two things, friends, remember every opportunity you can to share it with others. If then they say, well, what are the Baha'i teachings? You say, okay, I'll take you to a meeting or I'll take you to a friend of mine. If you don't feel capable of giving a, a proper picture, we all sometimes attempt to give pictures. Shoghi Fendi said the first stage of a teacher is when they teach their favorite part of the faith and nothing else but that, and then they add their own ideas on top of it, which kind of neutralizes the effect of it <laughs> in many cases. Second stage is that we learn the faith well enough that we can give it in its pure form. In other words, we give a, an adequate account of what it is, but in our own words. Third stage, highest and most ideal, where we memorize characteristic passages from the writings and cite them from memory along with whatever explanation we're giving about the teachings. He presents these three stages as ideals and spiritual growth of development of ourselves as teachers. So I hope you'll all have a terrific bicentennial year and thank you very much for your patience to listen to the details of this. Thank you. Thank you, please. I don't know if you have any questions or if you've all been waiting too long tonight or I'll leave it to the chairman what you want to do. Perhaps we could have a few questions. I know it's been uh, a lengthy evening, but maybe a couple questions. Yes. Um, you touched on it briefly, but it's actually something I've been studying for the last several months. Um, the similarities between John the Baptist and the Bob, between the ignorant of the Quran and what he said about John the Baptist, but just from my own um, reading, I, you can't not see the similarities between the two mm -hmm. uh, from the start right until the start as well. Mm -hmm. No, of course, it's very parallel in the part of being the herald and a messenger, because the uh, we have accounts that in sure. So the question is about the differences or the similarities between the uh, mission of John the Baptist, who was the herald of Christ, and the Bob. Uh, one of the, the, the thing that is the distinctive thing is that the Bob reigns with Baha'u'llah over the destinies of the whole Baha'i dispensation until the next manifestations appear. So that's one thing. But there are also accounts in Islam about John the Baptist revealed laws. One of his laws was baptism. In case you thought, well, what kind of laws did he have? And he, and he baptizes the Christ also. So it's very, very parallel. There is an interesting exchange in the World Order Letters, World Order Magazine in the past. And I couldn't tell you what year it is, probably 85, but some scholar that's got control of that there was a back and forth between Firuz Kalzemzadeh and other Baha'i scholars quoting different passages in the writings that hadn't been translated with respect to the similarity of the missions of the Bab and, and uh, John the Baptist. It's amazing. John the Baptist played a very significant role in that. 
It's just that we have this unique plus in, the, in our era that the Bob together with Abdul Baha reigns over the destinies of the, of the faith. With, together with Baha'u'llah reigns over the destiny of the faith, yeah. Just explain what is meant by primal point a little bit more. It's not a concept I'm familiar with in like English language. I don't know if it has like a particular significance in another culture or if it's just all things made new. Yeah. Interesting question. <laughs> I, th I think one of the one of the important. Um, elements of this is the primal point also becomes the point of revelation in the sense that when the pen hits the paper it makes a point and then the point moves into a line and forms into different characters that become revelation. So revelation has the inspiration then it's all the whole revelation is made of the ink in terms of what we what we see of it years or decades later later and with that uh, movement of his pen he causes the movement of creation so that the point also he said the point revolves in the beginning of the tablet of Ishrakat you can read about this the point revolves in a mysterious way and brings into creation all existence every it all the whole revelation starts with a point, and I'm the primal point. That's, that's a hint at it, but look it up in the writings. You can find very various references to it. Please. Nocte ula. Ula. Nocte ula. Do you have time for a short story? Yes. Okay. Uh, Janabi Jalal Khazay was a very active teacher. He went on pilgrimage in 1951, early 52. They were, he was the first with Mr. Khadim, the first pilgrims after 10 years to go on pilgrimage from Iran. Because of the wars and the war of independence of Israel, the, uh, the uh, also the disaffections in the family of Abdu'l-Bahá against the guardian, pilgrimage had been suspended for all that time. And they were the first ones to come back to, to be allowed to come to the Holy Land, these two gentlemen. Mr. Causey says, I was, uh, I was a little apprehensive. I went to see Mr. Furtan. I said, you know, um, I, I want to go on pilgrimage, but I've heard that the guardian reads your mind and he knows everything <laughs> you're thinking. And I have had a kind of a rough background, you know what I mean? I don't know what ideas might come in my head and suddenly I'd be embarrassed. And Mr. Fortan says, well, it's true. He, he does understand a lot. I don't know if he reads minds or not, but he, it's something to consider. So Mr. Kazi prayed a lot about it. He said, I finally decided I'm going to. I'll chance it, you know, I'll go. He, he recounted this to me when he became hand in South America after the establishment of the Universal House of Justice. And I was one of the auxiliary board members that was serving under him. And he said, so uh, Mr. Khadr and I arrived and we stayed in the Eastern Pilgrim House and in the afternoon, it was this, the, uh, the habit, custom of the guardian, he would be driven up the mountain car would come right to the front of the pilgrim house there and he would join the Persian men. The women were meeting with Rea Khanum in the house of the master and Shoghi Effendi would join them as well after he finished visiting with the Persians. And so they'd walk together to the, to the shrine. Um, Mr. Khadim was a, impassioned with the guardian. He loved the guardian so much. Uh, Mr. Kazi says that we arrived at the marble steps, you know, the first movement towards the shrine, we get to the marble steps, and Shoghi Effendi praised Mr. Kadim in a very effusive way. And Mr. Kadim passed out. <laughs> 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 so 
So he says, Shoghi Fendi immediately was on his knees and holding Mr. Khadim's head in his hand and patting his, his cheeks, trying to revive him. And he opened his eyes and he saw the guardian <laughs> right there. <laughs> I passed out again. <laughs> Mr. Kaza said, we finally got him on his feet and we proceeded to go to the shrine. And uh, it was this, the subject of the guardian. He would take the pilgrims one day to the shrine of the Bob and then on a subsequent visit he would take them to the... But he wouldn't go to both shrines on the same day with them. Now we go, we're trying to get everything we can and we go everywhere. <laughs> but that, that wasn't the custom of the guardian. So this first visit of these gentlemen to the shrine of the Bob with the guardian. The guardian, of course, removed his shoes. They removed their shoes. They went inside. The guardian went right up to where the tablet of visitation was, stood there, and began to chant the tablet of visitation. I don't know, friends, can you imagine being in the shrine of the Bob with the sign of God on earth and he's chanting the visitation? If you can't get close that way, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so. Mr. Cause said, I stood at one side in the back where the curtains are, you know, the entryway was there, and we each stood on one side and waited for the guardian to finish, and the guardian then prostrated himself, and after some silent prayer, he stood up and backed out very reverently to come out of the shrine. He said, well, at that point, I didn't know Mr. Kazi said, I didn't know, if, do we face the sign of God or do we face the threshold? What? So he was fairly portly, he said, I managed to half-half it. <laughs> and Mr. Kodim did the same. And Shoghi Fendi backed out and came out, and they went forward then and said their prayers, and then they came out. And when they came out, Shoghi Fendi had put his shoes on, and he was pacing. And he was saying, the station of the shrine is very great. He said, the friends don't understand the station of the shrine. He said, we knew which friends he was talking about. That was clear. <laughs> we were the only ones there. And then as we stood up, uh, he began quoting these statements of Baha'u'llah. He's the point around which revolve all the manifestations of God and the prophets and saints of bygone ages are circling in adoration this blessed shrine. And he said, we got to the front, he had repeated several phrases like that, we got to the front of the shrine, and Mr. Cosley said, I didn't mean to, but I thought to myself, my, my heavens, what's left for Baha'u'llah? Everybody's here with the Bob. <laughs> so if any stopped, he said, turned around, looked right in my face, smiled, and he said, and then the Bob and all those that circle around him circle around Baji. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. <laughs>